So I'm, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, David Foster. And as you'll see momentarily, uh, he's been at the forefront of neurophysiology with regard to the hippocampus, um, forms of activity known as uh, replay and, and preplay, and, and memory. So uh, David uh, earned his, his doctorate uh, at Edinburgh after an undergraduate at Imperial College London. And at Edinburgh, he um, was working with uh, Richard Morris and Peter Diane, who was uh, located uh, at MIT at that time in Cambridge. And I gathered from David, he was actually shuttling back and forth um, transatlantically for a while, but ultimately decided that was not the ultimate, um, the best way to, to do a PhD and did the majority of the work in, in, in Cambridge. For his postdoc, uh, he again worked with Peter at the Gatsby Institute um, at the University of College London and uh, subsequently did, did postdoctoral studies at MIT, again, with, but this time with, with Matt Wilson. Uh, he then has uh, been a faculty member uh, at Johns Hopkins and now more recently uh, at, at Berkeley. Uh, his work has been uh, recognized by uh, multiple awards. Just to name a few, uh, McKnight Award, a Whitehall, a NARSAD Young Investigator, and a Sloan Research Fellowship. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, David with us today. And I'm look, looking forward to, David, your talk on um, a hippocampal replay. Great. Uh, thank you, Mark. Can you, can you hear me? OK, great. All right. All right, well, it's a great honor to be invited, and um, I hope you enjoy this talk. Um, let's see. All right. So this talk is in two parts. I've stolen the titles from, from all of you. First part is Remembering the Past. Um, time is short. So instead of this long, laborious introduction, I'm going to scoot through all of this stuff, because you already know it all already. And I can e explain everything with this one slide. All right. <laughs> so I'm interested in uh, the hippocampus. We have already heard about the hippocampus a lot. Uh, we know it has this role in formation of memory. What I do is I record the activity of single units, single neurons in the hippocampus in freely behaving rats. And so what you're looking at here is uh, one minute in the life of a rat that's running along a track that's about two meters long for a few seconds, and then pausing at the end of the track and consuming some food. And what you can see is the uh, raster plots of 19 simultaneously recorded neurons, um, principal neurons in the CA1 of the hippocampus, the output area. And what, you're, what they seem to be doing, and I've arranged the neurons in order so that you can see that this is what they're doing, they're firing in different places along the track. They're place cells, and they're activated according to the Nobel Prize winning story by the rat occupying different locations in space. But what uh, I noticed during my postdoc was interesting is that when the rat ends up at the end of the track, and really classically just these neighboring place cells are supposed to be active, in fact there were these periods where large numbers of cells were active seemingly all at the same time, but if you blow it up you see that there's structure to it. And you can see here the neurons are actually activated over a period of a about 100 to 200 milliseconds in a temporal order, which seems closely related to the order in which they fire during the running. In fact, it's in reverse order. So the cells at the current location at the end of the track fire first, and then slowly this thing moves back along the track. We call that reverse replay. And this happens at the same time. It's a bit of a delay, OK. As in the local field potential in the hippocampus, there's this thing called a sharp wave ripple. This is actually just the ripple you're looking at. But the point is, uh, there are these markers of general population activity in the hippocampus that we can also record. And it's during those that you get these replay events. So all of these are actually reverse replays that have this structure. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, replay. The finding of reverse replay was replicated 
uh, in several labs after it was discovered. Uh, but there was this really nice study from Cameron Deber showing that actually before, just as the animal's preparing to run along a track, you get this forward sequence. So the order has now been reversed. So this is a forward sequence over about 100, mil 100 and something milliseconds. And then at the end, you get a reverse sequence. So as the animal's about to do something, you get this prospective replay of what he's going to do. And then at the end, you get a retrospective reverse replay of what's been done. Of course, you've probably figured out that the rats are running up and down this track. So at the same time as you're getting forwards replay of the future path, you also intermingled at different moments are going to get reverse replays of what the animal's just done. Uh, we can tell those apart because the cells are actually, uh, many of the cells are directional. So we can tell the difference between a forwards replay of something that's about to happen and a reverse replay of the same space, but uh, that's been traversed in different heading direction. OK. So reverse replay is pretty weird. What could you do with it, right? I mean, I don't have reverse replays in my mind if that's what you think, if you think replay is a memory. Uh, so we had to come up with some kind of way of rationalizing this. We came up with this very, very simple model, which is, you know, imagine every time there's a reverse replay, there's some kind of fast onset, slowly decaying reward signal. If you pair these together, some downstream area could learn that nearby, near to the goal, there's high value or high levels of reward, and further and further away, there's less and less. And this, then subsequently, these play cells could drive some kind of expectation of reward that could guide behavior. Right? So you don't even have to buy into all this to see my main point here, which is that reverse replay only makes sense in terms of evaluating the current location. And, and, and so we hypothesized reward is about evaluating the current location. The point is, forwards replay isn't any good for that. Forwards replay is about locations that you're going to get to. So we hypothesized that Reverse replay makes sense, but only, only forwards replay shouldn't have any relationship with the reward. Reverse replay should. So about five years ago, we did an experiment where we put rats on the same linear tracks, just one of them, but one session followed by another session followed by another session on the same track. But in the second epoch, we increased the amount of food that is liquid chocolate that's available at one end of the track. So it's a reward change. And this is the kind of data we see, raw data in terms of sharp wave ripples. So this is, these are different, this is, this is 15 seconds of stopping, I'm sorry, 20 seconds of stopping at the end of the track. These are different trials. And these are the numbers of sharp waves. And this is the one, the one end of the track and the other end of the track. This is the one that got the raw change. This is epoch one, epoch two, epoch three. So I think it's pretty obvious that something happened at the change reward end on Epoch 2. There were a lot more sharp wave ripples. Um, it's actually more than that. It's the rate of sharp wave ripples changed. So it was increased at that, at that end. And now replay is harder to detect. You, with sharp wave ripples, you've got this. You can pull it off of a single wire somewhere near the cells. With uh, replay, we've got to record hundreds of cells at the same time at a single unit resolution. So we've got to be very close. But that shows the same pattern, which is that at the, uh, on, the, on the second epoch, the rate of replay goes up. But now we have this hypothesis, right, about what about forwards versus reverse? And this figure is a little complicated looking, but it's just saying, it's, it's saying what I said before, that if we look at the place cells now of 118 place cells, look at the place fields of these cells running in one direction along the track, if you see what those same cells do in the other direction, many of them are firing much less, and some of them are not firing at all. So it gets a much weaker representation. On the other hand, the cells that fire strongly in this direction are weak in the original direction. Right? So we can separate out uh, based on the firing of the cells. And so this is just when we decode these replays. And we'll see a little bit more about what we're talking about decoding. But basically, we have these representations of replay uh, which, if just in terms of position, would show traversal across the track. But once you break it out by which map is being used, you can see very clearly the difference between, uh, I think this would be a forwards replay 
of these uh, in this direction and a reverse replay of the same thing. Okay, so this is the, this is the result from five years ago, uh, which is that you get an increase. When you increase the reward, you get an increase in replay, but only reverse replay. Forwards replay, the rates are unaffected. And we did a similar experiment where we actually removed the reward altogether on Epoch 2, and that also showed a significant decrease in reverse replay rate, but didn't change forwards. So we have this intriguing idea that reverse replay is particularly sensitive to rewards, which is interesting, and it gave us this hypothesis that reverse replay may support retrospective learning about the values of locations, and basically in the light of what's just happened, and forwards replay may support prospective decision making, using potentially that information to decide where to go. The question though is, can we really find a reward-related mechanism to explain these results? Um, there are lots of things that could correlate with reward changes, lots of behavioral changes that could correlate. So to really, to really nail this, we need to have some mechanistic control over a well-known or some kind of mechanism of reward that we can manipulate and see if it has an effect. And so for, given the pattern of results and some results I didn't really focus on, it looked like the dopamine reward prediction error signal could be the one that explains what's going on. Now, to me, that's very interesting because these are largely two separate literatures. The literature in the hippocampus tends to be, uh, it, comes from, it has this historical basis in the cognitive map idea, which was it's supposed to be a reward-independent representation of space, or, and then it, 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 reward is thought to modulate it in different ways, but it's still supposed to be, uh, it's now often conceptualized in terms of models of the world. In some sense, the flexibility of a model of the world comes from not being tied to very specific rewards. On the other hand, the ventral tegmental area dopamine signal is implicated in conditioning learning, uh, sometimes called model-free learning, and, and there's an entirely different sort of literature there. And we were very excited about the idea of seeing if these things collide in the, in the, in the replay field. So this is the work of a postdoc in my lab, Matt Kleiman, uh, and we decided to do chemogenetic inhibition of, VTA, of the VTA dopamine signal. This is our strategy. Um, it's a fairly well-known technique, the DREAD technique, but we, um, we used transgenic uh, TH Cree rats, mm -hmm. um, in which uh, Cree recombinase is expressed, is restricted to TH positive cells, which means dopaminergic and neurogenergic cells, but we are able to specifically target the a Cree-dependent virus stereotactically to the VTA. This means that the end result of this is that um, this inhibitory dread is expressed only in dopamine cells in the VTA. So, and then later on, we'll be able to give uh, a drug systemically and minutes later suppress the activity of these dopamine neurons in the VTA and see if it does anything to replay. And that's very nice for electrophysiology because we don't have any complicated bits and pieces that we're trying to get to work to, as well as all of our recording electrodes, which is hard enough. This is quickly just showing uh, from three different rats the expression of uh, the reporter which shows where the dreads are uh, co-localizing with the TH positive cells in the VTA, you can see here, you get nice uh, uh, co-localization of these signals. All right, so what happens in this task that I already told you about? Rats running up and down a track. We're gonna focus in with these examples on the first two epochs. So the first epoch, the rats running up and down, and the reward at each end is the same, and then we change the reward at one end, okay? So, we are able to do a within animal study for the experimental rats. I should have said we have uh, control rats too where we express the reporter but not, and do everything, but they don't have the dreads expressed in the cells. But looking at these experimental animals, they have controls themselves of saline days or CNO days. CNO is the drug that we can give systemically to uh, uh, cause the suppression of the uh, dopamine neuron activity, but we can also give saline that should have no effect. So when we do this, 
Now you're looking at the rates of, of, of sharp wave ripples, I and mean, that's the easier thing to look at, uh, at the increased end or the unchanged end, and on epoch one in black or epoch two. So you can see that, uh, as you'd expect, there's this big increase in ripple rate at, uh, at the changed reward, where the reward has been increased, right? And then we also have this manipulation of sometimes the tracks are very familiar, sometimes they haven't been experienced before. And you get largely the same effect. So interestingly, when we block, um, well, you might find it interesting. For us, it's quite interesting. When you block uh, the dopamine neurons, you, you suppress dopamine neuron activity. Think the situation is largely the same on a familiar track. See, this looks the same. But what was really then gratifying is that on a novel track, you do get this messing up of the signal. So here, this is the sharp wave ripple rate on the end of the track that's been increased and the end of the track that has not been changed. And you can see that the rate goes up in both. So this unchanged end is very different. And you can imagine that if this is a signal that's going to evaluate, that the, uh, uh, is used to evaluate the meaning or outcome of, of, uh, of different places that you arrive at, this, this would be a bad thing to happen. Um, Overall, taking all the data, we see, uh, like I said, these two effects that as you go from epoch 1 to epoch 2, the effect of CNO in the experimental animals is to reduce, actually, a little bit the, rip the ripple rate uh, that, you should, that you should see, but increase greatly the ripple rate at the completely unchanged end. And the controls don't have that. So the result is aberrant ripple rates at both ends. Interestingly, there is an, a small behavioral effect. We've chosen this task to try and get behavior out of the way because it's a very simple task. And the animal's just shuttling back and forwards, and we, that's deliberate. In this one, we don't want differences, big differences in strategy or behavior to interfere with our results. Nevertheless, it was an interesting small effect in terms of the amount of time the animal spends at each of the ends. And there's not really big changes uh, in the, at the end that has the reward change. So you see, generally the animals spend a lot more time when there's a big reward uh, than, than in the epoch one where there's no, um, where the reward is just the same on both sides. But here you can see that the unchanged end, normal animals, or uh, this is the saline condition. So the, the experimental animals that, but on a saline day, actually reduce the amount of time they spend uh, in epoch two at the unchanged end, right? They're in a hurry to get back to the other one because the other one's more interesting. But our experimental animals don't do that. Okay. So one of the questions we have is how rapid are these changes to, sh to sharp wave ripples? I mean, is this some sort of gross change that is slowly happening, or is it something that might actually be reflecting things on a faster basis? So we have a second task where this time the animal's in here, and every single lap you get a different unpredictable reward at one end of the track. The changed end is now it's called the volatile end, and it's switching between these uh, five different levels of, of amounts of liquid chocolate. And you can see in these control animals, you do get this nice pattern uh, that does seem to reflect the amount uh, of reward that's available in any given trial. Uh, and I, I quite like this figure because you, you see this kind of stuff quite a lot in the monkey literature. You don't see that many figures like that in the rat literature. <laughs> but what is the signal really reflecting? I mean, there are a couple of things that could correlate with this. It could be that the, what's happening here is ripple, reflect, ripple, ripple rate is reflecting the, just the instantaneous value, the amount of reward, or maybe some general value that's uh, created out of multiple repetitions, sort of averaged over overlaps. So if it was, this is now showing you what we expect, these are just predictions, for given the current volume and given color-coded the volume of the previous trial, 
you know, if, it's, if this is independent of anything else, you'd expect that these, these little things to be flat. In fact, a value, uh, a value uh, representation might integrate over successive um, visits. So if you get two large rewards, you might be very convinced that this is a good place. You might be high here. On the other hand, reward prediction error classically might go like this. You might subtract the previous uh, reward amount because you're basically making these predictions all the time and your real and your error is what did I get now minus what did I get last time. When we plot the data from control animals, I think you can see that you do have this pattern that fits reward prediction error better than a value explanation. And again, to me this is sort of amazing because we're talking about ripple rates. You know, this is, firstly, it's a pretty noisy signal. We've always thought it was a pretty noisy signal. And you're getting these things, you know, once a second or something like that. And it's just, uh, and the animal's only stopping for a few seconds. But somehow you can see there is clearly this kind of pattern. Now, when we block with, uh, we, when we block the activity, or rather suppress the activity of dopamine neurons in VTA, it looks like it messes it up. Actually, these two are not statistically different. And that doesn't surprise me because this is, a, like I said, it's a pretty noisy uh, signal. We can't say either way. It could be that this is actually disrupting the, the RPE calculation, or it might not be. We don't know. But certainly, we can conclude that uh, sharp ripples are, in the normal case, reflecting that. So then we go back to the original experiment, and we say, what about replay? And Again, this is harder for lots of technical reasons. It's kind of harder to get the numbers of cells we had before. But we can still do this trick of defining place fields by uh, defining cells as firing mainly in one direction or the other based on their fields. And that way, we're able to pull off very distinct reverse or forwards replays. Uh, and we, that's all that's saying. So then what happens? So now we're looking at the rate of reverse replay in control animals in, the, in either saline sessions or CNO sessions. And what you can see is that uh, we're looking at the balance between the increased end and the, un and the unchanged end. And you can see that the amount of reverse replay goes up from between epochs, uh, and likewise, if you look at it the other way around, you'd say, given at each end, what's the difference between epoch two and epoch one? It goes up for the increased end, right? But what you can see in the experimental animals is that the reverse replay, the difference, the difference is flatlined. So, and in the saline days for these animals, you get the expected increase. Uh, the, the, un, the unbalancing of the increase versus unchanged end in terms of rates on, e, on, on, on epoch two, but that's completely gone when the dopamine uh, signal is suppressed. And likewise, if we look at it as a difference between epoch two and epoch one, that is gone uh, at the uh, that is gone at the increased end of the track. And if we then look at forwards replay, that shows none of these changes, right? So it really does look like we've managed to isolate this effect on reverse replay. So part one conclusions, normal rates of hippocampal sharp rate ripples during stopping periods are dependent on VTA dopamine neuron activity. In particular, the spatial localization of the sharp rate ripples is altered by reducing VTA dopamine. Strikingly, increased rewards leads to increased ripple rate at the wrong end of the track. When the reward changes from trial to trial, the sharp ripples do track the changes, and it looks like they follow uh, reward prediction error, the classic signal that we expect to find from these cells. And then examining forwards versus replay, we replicate the original finding that reward changes are driven by a change to reverse replay alone. And we find that this change is dependent on VTA dopamine neuron activity. All right, so much for the past. <laughs> Let's do imagining the future. So some of you may know this classic study now, uh, it's 15 years old, where hippocampal patients, uh, patients who classically show these memory problems, were asked to imagine themselves 
in future situations that they've not necessarily been in and give a description of it verbally. And so uh, the, uh, the classic finding is you ask a patient, imagine you're lying on a white sandy beach, you know, tell me about this. And here's one of the responses, you know, I can't really, apart, as for seeing, I can't really see anything apart from just sky. Um, you know, I can hear some stuff, but I can't see it. So the experiment asks, are you actually seeing this in your mind's eye? No, the only thing I can see is blue. So if you look around, what can you see? All I can see is the color of the blue sky, the white sand. Uh, can you see anything else? No, it's like I'm floating. Whereas the, uh, the normal uh, person can give a quite nice story about walking on the beach and having various experiences. So. Can we have anything, anything even close to uh, an animal model of this? So a while ago in the lab, we developed this spatial memory task, which is a rat has to run around in this two meter by two meter open arena and find food in one of 36 locations. But we have a task here that is a memory task. So basically on odd trials, the animal has to find the food and he doesn't know where it's gonna be. So he finds it there. On the even trial, he can go back to a remembered goal location. And then, as soon as that reward is consumed, he has to look again for the, he doesn't know where it is, and then he can go back, right? So he's toggling um, between these two tasks. And we do, in fact, find that it takes them much longer to find the random well than the remembered one. So they can remember it, they can't smell their way to it, et cetera, et cetera. We record uh, a large number of place cells simultaneously, and this shows you the place fields of those cells. So each one of these figures is representing a two, the two meter by two meter space, and a heat map shows the firing rate as a function of space. And you can see there are these unusual cells that fire everywhere. They're interneurons which can actually, which can actually be taken out based on waveform alone, which we do. The rest of the cells, you can see these are the place cells, and they fire, uh, there would be a bunch of other cells that are not active, that we could identify in sleep, and here they wouldn't show much activity at all. The rest of these cells fire in these spatially localized regions. So this is the map, right? But I wanna show you what the, what the map does dynamically, right? So I'm gonna show you this decoding, and I, I alluded to this before, but this is essentially how the decoding works. It's actually very simple. Um, there's a math to it, which I'm gonna skip. But the, 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 the intuition is, um, if I see, if I have four cells with place fields like this, and they each spire, little spire, they each fire a spike. I think we should say spire for fire a spike. It's very efficient. Uh, they each spire once. Then I'm going to have a strong belief that the animal is here, right? So I can plot that. So I'm just going to plot essentially the posterior probability. And this is the movie. And I think I have to come over here to make this happen. All right, so what you're seeing now is a rat running, uh, performing this task, actually. And you can see his position. It's a depiction of his position and where, and where he's heading. And the flickering is this posterior probability that was generated. There's actually a pixel for every, there's a, there's a value for every pixel throughout the space. But the, the uh, representation is so tightly uh, locked to his position that it looks like it's just hovering over him. This was in real time. But the interesting part is what happens next. So in this task, we're now going to show a movie of four of these sharp wave ripple events. Now, the movie is slowed down, right? Because each movie is going to, you're going to see it in about a few seconds, but it's really just 100 milliseconds or something like that. Uh, but this is what happens. In these four successive events, the representation of position actually smoothly moves away from where the animal is and moves off in the direction of the remembered goal and stops there. Right, so that's, that's I think, memory retrieval in a spatial task and it's what replay could really be for. So these are examples of, you know, it's, it's so smooth in this case that we can compress time altogether and I can just show you these as trajectories. And you can see that there's all sorts of different kinds of trajectories that can be produced, uh, and you know, large numbers of them actually go towards the goal uh, and, and correlate with the future path that the animal's going to take. 
I won't belabor this slide, it's all published. There's one little wrinkle to this, actually a feature, not a bug, which is that every random, so every day we actually made a different location the home well. So we have to actually learn it again every day. I think that was important just to get the animal to stay interested and to keep the system engaged, but it also has this nice feature, which is because we don't repeat the random wells within a day, and we move the home well every day, it means that every trial is really a novel combination of start and end point, like completely novel for the animal. It means he knows this space very, very well, but he's never had to sort of start here and go there, right? So now you can see in the next movie, we put together the different Time scales. So the first slide you showed to us that the 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 report the sharp wheel report and the, the reverse firing, and I am wondering that the the cell number is based on their uh, firing timing because you record these cells randomly, but you can sequence these cells uh, one to one hundred and uh, and because their firing timing is different. Is, I, no, no, I, is that the it. way to find the reverse replay or forward replay? So actually, so it would be very hard to do this if we just looked for a sequence and said, this is a sequence, and then it happens again, and it happens again. People have looked for that. Uh, you know, there's a long history in neuroscience of trying to claim that there are sequences uh, just based on the firing that you're interested in. We already had a template, right? We have the sequence that comes from the behavior. So we have the sequence of place fields. that uh, They're just different spikes. The animals, during the running, those spikes map out a behavioral sequence. And then we look during the stopping periods for these much faster sequences. It's the same sequence that's getting repeated or reverse. Right? So it'd be very hard to do if we only had the sharp wave ripple uh, related stopping data. Then we'd be trying to say, well, this sequence happens a little bit more, like, more often than some other sequence of noise that we see and so on. But by having the behavioral template, that, that gives us a lot more statistical power. Okay, so for my understanding is so you got the spike uh, firing timing at first, but then I then get the the cell identity based on the firing timing. Yeah, well we know we know how to where to put the cell on we know which where to put the cell on the Y axis based on the where the place field what the place fields are like. And then that activity is not place it's not during the traversal of the place fields, it's afterwards. Okay, thank All right, you I think I should carry on, because everybody wants to see this movie, apparently. <laughs> All right, so this is putting together the two time scales now. And you see the animal looking for the food. So at least you saw one example. So when the animal is planning what to do, you get this intriguing activity that moves forwards towards the goal location. Um, and this was the summary. The, the sequences in the spatial task tend to start in the current location, end of the goal, and predict the path the animal's about to take. But that's a very simple environment. Right? There's really, it's just an open field. You know, maybe there's just something about the, I don't know, the overlapping of the fields, or there's some very simple geometric way in which this could occur. What about real mazes? And so, you know, inspired by this fella, Edward Talman, uh, who came up with also, who was trying to prove in the 20s and 30s that rats were smarter than everybody else thought they were, and came up with a bunch of interesting tasks, putting barriers and trying to make the animal puzzle out what to do. Uh, really interested in the idea that it's not, a cognitive map really isn't just about memory, it's about puzzling things out. We, my postdoc, John Widlowski, uh largely on his own, came up with this uh, really interesting task. Uh, this was published just a few months ago. So he decided to base it on the task I already told you about, but put in these barriers. But the barriers are very special. They were the, he calls them the jail bar barriers. So basically, the animal can see through them. He even put his snout there and smell through them. Right? They're really not perceptual barriers, but they are movement barriers. He can't move through them. And then, just to really mess with the animal, keeps changing the positions of these barriers. They're basically random permutations of six, six, uh, six locations out of 12 possible locations. And he creates this sequence of very different barrier locations every session. 
And we started off thinking every day, but then we ended up doing multiple sessions in a day. So the animal has this whole experience of many, many trials with one barrier configuration, then a few hours later, a couple of hours later, a different barrier configuration, and then a third one. And we don't need to read all that. So the behavior is substantially the same. So the animal uh, can't go through the barriers. He is able to uh, get to uh, these home wells, the remembered well, much more quickly than to the, uh, when he's doing the random foraging uh, part. Um, and this is sh shown by a bunch of different ways. But uh, so the probability of the rat visiting the well in the first five seconds is much higher for the home well. Uh, what does the replay do? Well, the first surprising thing to us was actually what do the place cells do, right? So we record these, these cells have place fields. They say one hippocampal cells, they have place fields. Uh, looking at the three configurations within a day. So this is a very similar plot to the one I already showed you, but now there are three plots for each cell, corresponding to the three, the, 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 the morning, lunch, and evening session, right? With three different barrier configurations. And you see, largely, the cells with fields kind of fire in more or less the same place. There are sometimes small changes, but what there isn't is a complete global remapping, which might have been expected. I mean, this, is, this requires different behaviors, not running, but different uh, navigational choices. And yet the same, on the other hand, the sensory environment is, is being preserved. So it's a, this goes with the sensory environment. But then what does replay do? This is an example of a replay. The animal is stationary again, uh, and facing in this direction, but the replay in this case nicely goes around, start, sign is early, nicely goes around on its way to the home well. And um, across all the replays, again, this is not behavior, this is replays, this is in the animal's head, in his neurons, not in his behavior. You see that the replays in general respect these constraints. But I want to point out a remarkable thing about this. Firstly, this is three different sessions in the same day. Moreover, this is the 75th, 76th, and 77th unique configuration the animal has experienced. So he's learning very, very rapidly, uh, after just a little bit of experience, to hone and change his predictions that are being produced by these replays. Um, and this just shows some examples of, of individual ones, but you can see some very nice examples of these replays that just wend their way around the barriers and seemingly allow the animal to puzzle out his way through these mazes. And uh, there's a higher probability of the replays terminating at the home well than the random wells. And the probability of the rat visiting the home well in the first few seconds is higher if there's been a replay that's terminated there. So we made it to part to the conclusions. The replay associated activity imagines future paths around barriers to remember distant goals. Demonstrates striking plasticity in the hippocampal replay because these are completely unpredictable, novel configurations that we just made up, really, just randomly. Uh, but the animal is quickly able to Quite, so there's striking plasticity in the replay, strongly dissociated with place fields. So these are the place fields replay, it's the same cells doing the same, you know, just spikes from the same cells. The way they represent space during behavior is being very stable. And, and in fact, in a, I didn't show you, but there's some examples where we at least think we can hold a cell. It's not completely kosher, but we claim that we can hold a cell across many days, and we see the same place field for that cell. If I can make a stretch here, to me this suggests one way to get at a persistent issue, which is which concerns place fields and the idea that you remap and that a different map is required for every memory you have. There's obviously a close relationship between space and memory. People have known about that for thousands of years. Uh, but most of your memories <coughs> occur in a small number of places. You have thousands of memories in one or two places. You have memories in your home. You have memories maybe in this room. Uh, and you want to keep them separate. And so this is just the beginning, I think, of a 
of an understanding of a mechanism where if we think of the replay as the retrieval of a memory, you can have many different kinds of memories associated with the same stable uh, representation of space. And that's it. Thank you to well, many people in my lab that did this work. Uh, today it was John and Matt. And thank you for listening. So, should, we, should we give this one more go as well? But please uh, ask a question. Let's see, I, we have a question there. Hi. Hi, David. We're here. Hello. Uh, really fascinating talk. I had a question about the dopamine results. Yeah. So I would have thought of dopamine as amplifying the rewarded side of the track. But without dopamine, it, from your actual ripple rates, it looked like both sides of the track now had the same rate as on the 4x side, as opposed to the same rate as the 1x side. So do you think of dopamine as suppressing the least valuable option when it's on board? So I think that there's also a clue the fact that it's really the novel, it's really, really happening on the novel track, and things are so suppressed and familiar. We already knew that replay rates kind of go down on a familiar track. So there's some. So it's also understood that while there are lots of dopamine receptors in the hippocampus, it's not clear that they're being activated by VTA dopamine. And right? so we think that there's a sort of parallel story to be told, perhaps by us, uh, by somebody, that you know, noradrenergic input might be responsible for uh, maybe the overall levels of sharper ripples or something like that. Um, and that, yeah, this is this is. This is just a subset of that. Uh, it could be suppressing, or but somehow sculpting where you know the the, the correct spatial location of it. But yeah, we don't we don't have a, a good model of exactly how that works. But we know that there's this other system that is probably promoting the the, the occurrence of the sharp ripples. Yeah. Thank you. In your last experiment with uh, with the barriers, you showed trajectories that also crossed barriers. So the rat yeah. apparently forgot they are there. Were the trajectories yeah. predictive of the actual uh, routes it traveled? And did they make mistakes in those trials? Yeah, yeah. So no, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't, we, didn't I, we, we, we didn't see rats hurl themselves into the barriers. <laughs> no, we could have. And in fact, they didn't do some, with the very first experiment ever done with rats, in 1901, by a fellow called Small, did exactly that. He had a real maze, and he short, after training the rats, he would shorten the barriers, and his observation was the rats would run straight into the walls. Uh, so we could have found something like that, but we didn't. I think it's just a very, you're doing the behavior the animal is actually aware of the barrier structure and isn't going to do that. Uh, you could imagine a more subtle analysis where we try to say, well, did the rat head in that general direction? I mean, basically, we don't have a good enough, it's not a one to one relationship of having a replay and then the animal actually just follows that trajectory. We're very interested in the question of trying to suppress particular replays and see if we can have an effect on behavior. That's a huge question that we're trying to address. But your specific thing, there's nothing really physically to stop the animal having trajectories that move uh, in his mind, in, in, the, in the hippocampus, that move through the barriers. And a priori, with all of the changes that we did, we almost expected to see that. We almost expected that the barriers might not really control the animal's replays at all by that point. You know, this is a space that, once you've had 90 different configurations, why bother, right? So in a sense, the fact that 80 percent or 90 percent of the replays do respect the barriers to us shows that that's, a, that that's a key constraint. And the other ones could be memories of previous sessions or noise, right? And we don't have enough data. We don't, the data is not in a form that we could really tell those apart, but those are very interesting possibilities, right? It could be a specific memory of yesterday I could get through and today I can't. Yeah. Okay. I'm being told we have time for one more question. A naive question. So you, these are the same set of cells, right? That seems to be toggling between two programs. One is reporting the physical space. The other one is, um, you know, memory of the goal-oriented uh, direction. So how how does the toggle work? Yeah. Uh, uh, phenomenal phenomenologically, uh, as soon as the rat stops moving, the uh, it, it, that was an observation. It turns out by O'Keefe and Adele in the 70s that the place code 
is much less, it basically goes away when the animal stops moving. What I think they were seeing was replay, but they didn't have enough cells to tell at that time. So yeah, so when the animals are moving, you get the place field activity. But it's interesting, even during movement, it's well understood that, uh, you, that if you look at the populations of cells, there is a sequencing there as well. It's just uh, when you average the data for one cell, it looks like a place field. But, but across cells, you have these small little look-ahead sequences that are essentially constrained to the place field, but do have this sequential nature on exactly the same time scale as replay. But replay will be extended th uh, you know, uh, throughout the environment. These short, they're called theta sequences, are just looking just ahead of the animal. Great. Let's uh, thank David again.